Hey everyone. This is something that a lot of you have probably tried doing in the past. Take a ruler or any other thin bar shaped object, hold one end against the table with the other end sticking out a little bit off the table, and then basically just flick the end of the bar. You'll notice that that end of the bar will vibrate with a certain frequency and you'll hear a certain pitch of sound come off of there. If you've ever done this yourself, you've probably noticed pretty quickly that if you change the length of the section that is allowed to freely vibrate, that will change the frequencies of those vibrations and the pitch of the sound that you're able to hear. So if we have a longer section off the end of the table and we give that a flick, we're going to hear lower frequency sounds. It's going to be a lower frequency vibration. And if we shorten that bar, we're going to hear higher frequency sounds, higher frequency vibrations. We shorten it even more. Then the shorter that bar, the higher the frequency of sound that we hear. We're going to take this simple demonstration and turn it into an experiment by taking a piece of aluminum and measuring what are the frequencies of sound produced when different lengths of aluminum are off the end of the table. We're going to be measuring those frequencies just using some of the sensors that we have on our phone. And this is a, an experiment that you can kind of put together yourself with very simple equipment. And not only are we going to be able to look at some of the general properties of these uh, vibrating clamped bars, we're also going to be able to use this to measure some of the physical properties of this bar of aluminum, specifically the Young's modulus or the stiffness of aluminum. And this can actually be used to measure the stiffnesses of any arbitrary material. We're just going to use aluminum for this particular example. So let's start by having a closer look at the claim of what physics says should be the properties of these vibrating clamped bars. So let's have a closer look at the particular system that we're looking at, this bar that is clamped at one end. So one end is being rigidly held in place. It can't bend ideally at all. The other side is able to freely move, and when we flick the end, it'll vibrate with a certain fundamental frequencies. There are also higher frequencies that this can vibrate with, but I'm getting ahead of myself. So let's say we've got this bar that is clamped at one end. We're going to say that L is the length of the bar, A is the thickness of the bar, the Greek letter rho, that's going to denote the density of this bar. In this case, we're using aluminum, which has a specific density. And we're also going to be talking about the Young's modulus, which is denoted by a capital E. So I mentioned this Young's modulus a couple minutes ago. What actually is this quantity? So let's take a quick detour on talking about the Young's modulus. This is related to the stiffness of a solid. It could be different kinds of metal, different kinds of ceramic, plastics. Uh, they would all have different values for this Young's modulus. And basically, imagine I have a bar of this material that has a certain length and a certain cross-sectional area. And I start applying some forces to either end of that bar in order to get it to stretch. So let's say I apply some forces. The stress acting on that material is defined as how much force is being applied per unit area on either side of this material, on either side of this bar. And the strain is basically a measure of how much does the bar get stretched by, how much does the length of the bar change by compared to the original length of the bar. You can think of this as the fractional change in the length of the bar. Did it get 1% uh, longer, 2% longer, a tenth of a percent longer, or something like that? Well, the Young's modulus is defined as the stress acting on that material divided by the strain that that material will undergo. Again, we're assuming that we are looking at it before it's gotten to its yield strength, before other things start happening, including eventually starting to fracture and, and actually break. We're looking in the initial conditions when I just start to get this thing to stretch. So this Young's modulus, it's the force per unit area, that stress acting on the material, divided by the strain, the fractional change in length. In terms of units, this fractional change in length is dimensionless. It's the change in length in meters divided by the original length in meters. So this doesn't have any units. 
And the only units that we're left with for this quantity are this force per unit area. Newtons divided by meters squared, which is the units that we associate with pressure, and pascals are the SI unit for pressure. One pascal is a newton per square meter. Okay. And again, different kinds of materials will have different values for this Young's modulus. Some materials that are not isotropic, some materials will have different Young's modulus in different directions, things like carbon fibers. If I try to stretch or compress that along the direction that the fibers are extended in, that's going to be much harder than if I'm applying those stresses uh, perpendicular to that direction. But for a lot of materials, a lot of materials that are isotropic, it just has a single value for this Young's modulus. And that's what we're going to be looking at today. Again, we can get into a lot more complicated concepts associated with these material properties. This is very, very important in things like structural engineering. If I'm trying to make a building where there's beams that are going to have loads applied to them, this becomes very, very important to make sure that building won't fall over. So again, that's the basic idea of this Young's modulus. It's related to the stiffness of the material, and it's a property of whatever type of solid material you're working with. So back to this clamped free bar. Okay. We said we've got the bar length, we've got the thickness, we've got the density, and we've got the Young's modulus. So the claim for this system is that if I flick the end of this bar, the fundamental or lowest frequency vibration that will start being generated, again, assuming that we've got a thin bar with a rectangular cross section, is approximately given by this equation. This 0.6, sorry, 0.162 times the thickness of the bar divided by the length squared times the square root of the Young's modulus divided by the density. Now, whenever we are presented with a new equation, a really good thing to do is to just kind of look at the properties of that equation, just kind of think through if I change certain terms, what will happen to those frequencies? We've already talked about how if I have a longer section of the bar off the end of the table, those frequencies should be lower. So if I increase the length of the bar, well, if I'm increasing the denominator of this fraction, the value of that fraction should go down. A longer bar should give us a lower frequency. You could also think, what if I had a really, really stiff material? Well, if I have a really, really stiff material that really doesn't want to move, when I flick the end of it, it's going to be vibrating at a very, very high frequency. So if I increase the Young's modulus, if I increase that value of E, that means it's going to tend to vibrate at a higher frequency. Now, looking at it in this way gives us some general ideas of does this equation seem plausible, but again, we're going to have to go into more detail and actually make some measurements to see does this equation actually hold true? Can we get experimental evidence in support of this? And just to kind of measure some of the properties of this bar, as I said, we are going to be using an aluminum bar, and aluminum has a density of around 2,710 kilograms per cubic meter. Uh, the thickness of this bar, if I grab my digital calipers here, this is around uh, 1.8 millimeters. Hopefully that's uh, visible on the video. Uh, it was around 1.8 millimeters. Again, this bar, it's listed as a half inch by 1 16th of an inch. 1 16th of an inch is around 1.6 millimeters. Again, I got around 1.8 when I was using the calipers. Could have been around like 1.7. That might be one of our largest sources of error in just figuring out exactly how thick that bar is. But again, it's around 1.8 millimeters. And the claim includes that the Young's modulus of aluminum is around 7.0 times 10 to the 10 pascals. If you look it up, you'll see it listed as 70 gigapascals in a lot of resources. And the length of the bar, that's something that we're going to be changing in each of the parts of the experiment. So during the experiment, I'm going to be setting up the bar, clamping it in place to have a certain value for the bar length, which we will record. And then we're going to be using the spectrum analyzer on the phone to identify what frequencies 
are being generated when I flick the end of the bar. And we're going to map out how that bar length affects those different frequencies and see whether it matches up with this particular form of this equation and whether we're able to use that data to actually measure, not assume, what this Young's modulus voluminum is, but actually measure it. So let's set up our first trials. So let's have a look at this initial setup. We've got the aluminum bar extending off the end of the table a certain distance. I've tried to clamp this in place as rigidly as possible and have that right connected to the edge so we can accurately measure how long this bar is. And I'm going to have my phone set up right here so we'll be able to pick up the sound waves that are coming off of this bar. And whatever are the frequencies of the sound waves that are being generated, that should match the frequency that the bar is vibrating with as well. So for this first test, I kind of picked a medium length bar, but let's see what we've got for this first length. So if I measure that, that's around 14.4 uh, centimeters. So that's going to be 0.144 meters. And let's see what happens when we do our initial test for this. So here we go. So it was quick there, but we have the trace on here, and you'll notice that it wasn't just one frequency of sound that was being produced. There are actually multiple spikes in the graph. Uh, a large one over here on this side, so around uh, 62, 60, around 63 hertz on that side. We'll look at that in more detail later. And that lowest frequency is the one that we're going to be focused on for most of this experiment. As I mentioned, there are other frequencies that the bar can vibrate with, and if we look up this reference from uh, a website called Hyperphysics, which I actually find to be a really useful resource for quickly looking up some equations, they have all the references in there, um, but for a clamped bar, like the one we're looking at, we've got our fundamental frequency, which is the one that we've been talking about so far, but there are also higher frequency modes that we can look at. So the next highest frequency, the bar is going to vibrate in a different kind of way. It's going to have kind of a weird wobbly effect to it. And the claim is that that should be at 6.27 times the lower frequency. Well, notice we have another pretty strong spike right around 400. Let's see if I can nail that down a little bit more precisely. Around 398 hertz, we get our second large spike. Again, there are a couple of other ones. There might be some other sources in the room, some things about the table itself that are vibrating. But this is the next significant spike after that lowest frequency. So if we compare those two frequencies, this 398 hertz divided by the fundamental one, which was around 62 or 64, let's split the difference and call that 63, when I divide those two, then the ratio of those frequencies that I get is 6.32, which is really, really close to this 6.27 given in this particular reference. So again, there are higher frequency effects, higher frequency modes to this vibration that are going to be happening in the bar at the same time. But for the purposes of this experiment, we're just going to be focused on those low frequency parts. And because of that, I'm going to zoom in our graph onto the part between, say, 0 and maybe like 150 hertz. Okay. So hopefully, zoomed in like this, we'll be able to better peg down exactly what this lowest frequency uh, part of the system is. So let me move that out of the way. Let's do reset the hold. And let's try this again. Okay. So again, we're looking at where does that highest peak occur? We can look at either the max trace that's on here. Sometimes that can get a little bit noisy and there's other effects of processing, since it's trying to process this in real time, uh, we are going to get a little bit more wider features than we would like to get, but we can still kind of find where the middle of this is. And we can look at this waterfall diagram. The brighter it is, uh, going side to side, the 
more intense the sound is at those particular frequencies, the louder the sound is at those frequencies. So again, this looks like it's around the 63 hertz point. So let's put that for F1. So that is 63 hertz. Okay. So we've got ourselves a data point. And basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to start cycling out different, uh, I'm going to move the bar different amounts. I'm going to make these uh, a little bit longer at first and then a little bit shorter and measure what frequencies, what do we get for those fundamental frequencies at a whole bunch of different distances. And we're going to graph and see what kind of pattern is produced by that data. I'm going to do a little bit of fast forwarding here, but there are going to be some limitations for the longer and longer bars. Eventually we're going to be getting down to just a few tens of Hertz and notice that this is only going to be able to measure frequencies to about an accuracy of one Hertz. So if I'm getting below say 20 Hertz, being off by one cycle per second, that's like a 5% error, which is getting a little bit larger, which is not something that we want as much. So that's gonna limit us on how long we can make this bar. On how short we can make the bar, when I have a shorter bar, the sound dampens, dampens away pretty quickly. So that'll also make it a little bit harder to get these frequencies, but we'll try to get a fairly wide range of data. So yeah, I'm gonna start playing around with a couple more of these and let's see what we get. So I'm gonna start with some longer ones. Okay, so this is 16.1 centimeters. So 0.161 meters. And let's reset the hold, let's see what we get. Okay, so those peaks, if we look at that, it looks like it's around 51 hertz. Let's make the bar longer. Okay, that is 18 centimeters, 18.0 centimeters, so 0.18. Let's see what we get for our next frequency. That seemed to be where we were getting that lower frequency. That looks like it's around 41 hertz. So the length of this bar is 18.9 centimeters, so 0.189. We'll probably go to longer jumps, but let's reset. So that one looks like, looks like 37 for that one. This one is 20.4 centimeters. That's between 31 and 32. Well, let's call it 31. That'll work. Try a few more and then go to shorter lengths instead. Okay, so this is 23.2 centimeters. Let me just make sure that's right. Yep, 23.2. So again, at this point, it's getting hard to kind of identify them as much, but again, I do three flicks just to make sure I'm not getting uh, something in the background. Maybe my computer fan is running at 75 hertz. That would kind of make sense. Um, but right here, that seems to be around 25 hertz. So we'll do that one, and maybe we'll try one more small, one more longer one, and then switch to smaller. And I got that right at 25 centimeters. And 
It's getting kind of hard to see them, but right there is, I think, where we're getting that lowest frequency. So let's extract that at 21 hertz. Okay. So now let's switch this up and go the other direction. We're going to go for shorter bars, so we should be getting higher frequencies. So this is at 12.8, 12.8 centimeters. Let's see what frequency we get now. All right, so we find a peak of that. Looks like that's around 78. Seems to be making a nice pattern on our graph. And let's keep on shortening this up. So the length is 11.6. Okay, so right around there was where we got that peak. Again, it got a little broadened out by some of the other things that are vibrating. The hook at the bottom seems to be shaking a little bit. Um, trying to hold that in place so it doesn't cause any excess rattling. Uh, so that was around 93 hertz. Three. And we'll do a couple more in this direction. Seems to be showing up right around 120, 124. Oh, I didn't measure the length of that. That one was 10 point, 10 .2. And that frequency was 124. Let's see if we can get one or two more on here. This is, again, getting down to our, our shorter limit on what we're going to be able to measure. Let's see if we can get maybe one or two. And I'm actually going to need to uh, stretch this out a little bit more in case we get higher frequencies than I expect. Make sure that's nice and close to the bar so we can read that. Uh, this one is at 9.2. A little bit wide on that one, maybe 149, 148, somewhere in there. Let me see. Okay, it looks like 149 for that one. And maybe we'll try one more. I'm not entirely thinking that this might give us the best values, but let's give it a try. This is 8.1. In fact, I'm going to see if I can zoom this in a little bit more in the area that we kind of expect it to be in, somewhere in this kind of a range, but let's see what we get. So that was right around 187. So, if we look at this data, Notice we are getting a very particular pattern of data. And again, in our claim, the claim was that the frequency de should depend on one divided by that length squared. Okay. So let's see how we can analyze the best fit that we're gonna get from this to our particular claim. So we've now got some experimental data where for a bunch of different bar lengths, we've measured what is the lowest frequency that is generated by the vibrations of that bar when we flick it. And we also have this claim of given a bar of a certain thickness and a certain length made of a certain material, so it has a certain Young's modulus and a certain density, what should, what does this model predict should be those lowest frequencies of the vibrations? 
So how do we compare our claim with our data? Well, let me start by writing out the claim in a slightly rearranged form. So all I've done here is I've grouped together all of the terms that are constant. We didn't change the thickness of the bar. We didn't change the material it was made out of. So the Young's modulus and the density are staying the same. I've grouped all of those together. And instead of having one over length squared, I just wrote that as length to the power of minus two. Well, this equation has the form of a power law. And a power law is always of the form y equals a times x to the power of b. On our graph, notice we put the fundamental frequency, that lowest frequency vibration on our vertical axis. So those match up with each other. And we put the bar length on the horizontal axis. So the bar length, that's what we put on the horizontal axis. Those match up with each other. So if this claim is accurate, and if we've made our measurements reasonably accurate, again, there's always going to be some level of measurement error, then if we match up these terms, the exponent that we get, it should be described by a power law. This data should fit a power law. And that exponent should be negative 2 or something pretty close to negative 2. The coefficient that we get in front, well, that one should match up as the combination of all of these other constants. So let's actually take our data and apply a power fit. So we're going to do a power fit, try the fit, and let's see what we get from this. So I'm going to move this graph over so we can see it a little bit more easily. So our exponent for this power fit, it wasn't quite negative 2. We got negative 1.92, basically, plus or minus a little bit. Okay. So it's kind of close to negative 2. Not perfectly accurate, but not terribly far off. And let me try this. Uh, just since I was kind of wondering about that last data point, let's say I take out that last data point. Uh, and notice we're actually a little bit closer to our, uh, our expected negative two. But just for fairness, I'm gonna leave that other data point in. We'll stay with what we originally got, uh, even though maybe that last data point might not have been the most accurate one, since it was one of the hardest ones to accurately measure. So let's do some comparisons. This value of B, we were expecting negative two, and we got negative 1.92, basically. So let's do a percent error calculation, which is the you know, accepted minus the experimental over the accepted times 100%. So again, what we were expecting to get was uh, negative 2. What we got was negative 1.92, basically over, you know, we should do the absolute value of that. Value for negative two. And when I plug that in, I get 4% when I plug all that in. So we were about 4% off of the expected value for that exponent, which again, not bad. When we were measuring some of those frequencies, we said in the 20 Hertz range, which was the lowest that we got down to being off by one Hertz, one cycle per second would be about a 5% error. So yeah, that seems kind of uh, in the same error regime as what we're looking at here. When we talked about the thickness of this bar, um, that one shouldn't actually ex affect the exponent. So that one's gonna come into more play when we look at what's our error for the Young's modulus of this material. But again, 4%, not bad, being within 4% uh, of the accepted value. But what about this Young's modulus? Again, we said that if you look in engineering or material science resources, the Young's modulus of aluminum should be around seven times 10 to the 10 pascals. And let's see if we can extract that value from our data. Well, if we have that, this coefficient in front of my power law should be equal to this combination of terms, this 0.162 times the thickness of the bar times the square root of the Young's modulus divided by the density. Let's set those equal to each other 
with this value that we got for that coefficient. So we're saying that 1.525 should be equal to 0.162 times the thickness of the bar was 1.8 millimeters, again approximately, so 0 0.0018 meters, times the square root of the Young's modulus, which is what we're going to solve for, divided by the density of the material, the 2,710 kilograms per cubic meter. Well, let's divide both sides by uh, one point, sorry, point 0.162, and then divide both sides by the 0 0.0018, and I got 5,230 is equal to the square root of the Young's modulus over 2,700. Uh, 2710. We square both sides. So I got 27,350,000. Uh, 27, Again, we'll round it a little bit. And then multiply both sides by 2710. And I got 7.41 times 10 to the 10. So we got 7.41 times 10 to the 10. Our expected was 7.0 times 10 to the 10. So what's the percent error on this particular measurement? So let's do percent error. Uh, the 10 to the 10s, we can actually drop both of those since we've got both are multiplied by 10 to the power of 10 in the percent error calculation. That part will just drop off. So we can just compare 7.0 minus 7.41 over uh, 7.0 is our accepted times 100%. And when we plug that in, we get 0.41 divided by 7. So I got 5.9% error, 5.9%. And again, measuring the thickness of this bar, if we were off by just one millimeter, or sorry, just 0.1 millimeters, that would be probably enough to explain this error. Okay. So again, we got some fairly accurate results just by using uh, the sensor on our phone for measuring these frequencies and all the rest of this stuff was everyday household items and you can buy aluminum bars like this from uh, you know any local hardware store for a couple bucks a piece. You could even try this with different thicknesses of bars. And I, again, encourage people to try this on their own, to try seeing how these methods are applied. But again, for this particular experiment, some of the things I want to point out is that with this kind of uh, bar that's clamped at one end, we can build a model, this mathematical model, which is derived from things like what forces are acting on a bar as it goes through different kinds of strains, uh, again, that's where the Young's modulus is going to come into play, affecting uh, when this bar is bent a certain amount, when it has that restoring force, pulling it back to the middle, how is that bar going to be moving? It depends on things like moment of inertia. That's already been accounted for in this calculation, but in the derivation uh, for this equation, and I'll leave some links in the description for where you can go for these derivations, it's definitely a little bit mathy. It involves some pretty heavy calculus of variations material. But it involves things like moments of inertia, looking at the mass of the object, because the mass is going to affect how much inertia it has as it moves back and forth through that equilibrium point. It's a lot of complicated math to get to this particular claim, but we can still test out that claim. And when we perform the test, it seems to match very well. So again, all the math that goes into this, looking at things like how momentum comes into play, how conservation of energy comes into play for these kinds of oscillating bars, that seems to make predictions that quite accurately match with experiments. At least in this case, we were saying we were expecting things to be within about 5% accuracy, and for both the exponent and that coefficient in front, we got around 5% accuracy, uh, within 5% accuracy for those. So we'll call that one good for today. I uh, hope it was interesting. As always, if you have 
questions about how to modify these or if you have recommendations for other people on how we could modify this and have a different kind of experiment, do different kinds of variations of this, please throw those into the comments and have a good rest of your day.